This is Thursday, April 2nd, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Silvio Mandino. Welcome, Silvio. Thank you for having me. Now, this is going to be a little bit different because you're going to be talking about your brother, Augustine, who is known as Aug. Correct. Who was not only a World War II veteran, but became known as, around the world as an author and motivational speaker. And we'll yes. also be talking with you about your time in Natick, which was a very interesting uh, portion of the town's history. So let's uh, get underway here. May I ask when you were born? December 8th, 1937. And where were you born? It in Framingham, actually, Framingham Union Hospital. Because um, you were telling me before the interview, your family lived on D Street. That's correct. And tell us a little bit what D Street was like when you were growing up. Well, we're very close to the Framingham line, and mm -hmm. that's why uh, I was born in, in Framingham. We are about 500 yards from the Framingham Natick line, so mm -hmm. we were closer to Framingham Union than the Leonard Morris Hospital. So mm -hmm. out of convenience, a lot of things were done in Framingham. And a little problem with the mail and stuff? Yes, because if we put uh, D Street Natick, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> actually uh, D Street was known as Loker Street, L-O-K-E-R. Uh -huh. And there's another Loker Street in Natick, and mm -hmm. so that made it more confusing. It was only years later that it became changed to D Street. Okay. Do you remember anything about those early days? Well, I can remember there were a lot of woods and uh, trees, and we had the run of the neighborhood. Uh, a lot of Italian families on our street. Uh, my parents owned a couple of acres of land, and they very intensively farmed that with uh, raising fruit and vegetables, which they canned and preserved, mm -hmm. so. And how many, um, do you have any uh, siblings besides Og? Yes, uh, my, uh, my sister Jackie, mm -hmm. and uh, Susan, mm -hmm. uh, Tommy, and Michael. And what, what was the order of you and the family? Were you the baby? Uh, in the beginning, yes, I was the baby. I mm -hmm. was the third. Okay. Uh, my mother passed away when I was three and a half, mm -hmm. and uh, my father remarried and, and had another family. So. Okay. So tell us a bit about your brother, Augustine. Okay. Uh, Augustine graduated from Natick High in 1940. He was one of the editors of the Sassaman newspaper mm -hmm. in the yearbook also uh, earned a varsity letter in track, mm -hmm. outdoor track, and his coach at that time was Henry Plaus, who later became very famous uh, as a football coach at Natick High, turning that whole program around mm -hmm. and making it very successful. Now, one of the articles that you had sent before the interview, uh, your brother was telling about how he could beat anyone around in track except one person. Exactly. It was a gentleman from Framingham right. named Pino? Pizzo. Pizzo, yes. Uh, Frank Pizzo. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother ran some of his fastest times against him uh, in the uh, 100 yard, the 220 and the 440, mm -hmm. and he could never beat him. And Frank Pizzo later went on to become the uh, Class C state champion in those events. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Frank Pizzo lost his life in the mm -hmm. Navy in World War II. And there's a plaque at Bowditch Field near the outdoor track uh, mm -hmm. commemorating his name. Now, your brother had plans to go to college. Yes. Uh, what he, uh, my mother always told him that he was someday going to become a great writer. Mm -hmm. And she sat with him and read to him all the time. And uh, 
he planned to go on to journalism school, mm -hmm. college, and, and study journalism. Uh, and then tragically, uh, our mother died, and uh, that never came to pass. And then World War II came along. And uh, now, at the time, your brother was working at Denison. That's right. Was he drafted, or did he volunteer? No, he volunteered. He went down and signed up with mm -hmm. several other buddies, and uh, was interested in the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where he ended up in the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was sent to uh, officer's training school, mm -hmm. and uh, that was in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Yeah. And uh, he graduated from Natick High. He was only 16 and a half. Really? So if you do the math when he was born and when he graduated in 1940, it comes out to 16 and a half. So I believe somewhere along the line he got a double promotion. And they did that. Uh, Mm. In those days, they would just pass somebody along, mm -hmm. accelerated. So here he is competing in track. He's only 16 and a half, and some of these people he's competing against are a year or sometimes even two years older. Wow. So uh, he ended up in, in the uh, Air Corps, mm -hmm. went to Carlsbad, New Mexico for a bombardier navigation training. Mm -hmm. And that was extremely difficult training because there was a lot of advanced mathematics involved. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about trajectory and wind direction and velocity. And here he is, young, mm -hmm. uh, 1943, so he's 19 years old. And he's up against people with college degrees, mm -hmm. some college, and here he is, a high school uh, graduate but he ends up completing mm -hmm. that course. And those who washed out or flunked, they were sent to gunnery school mm -hmm. and they became sergeants. And those who, who finished became uh, were commission officers. And my brother always commented was, here he was a so-called officer and a gentleman in 1943 and not old enough to vote. <laughs> So no, no. I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to, to grow up here, and this town was about 13,000 people mm -hmm. at the time, and to go from here, in the way it was, off to that world stage of mm -hmm. situations. And he certainly wasn't alone. No, no, mm -hmm. of course not. Okay, so after completing the course in New Mexico, he's commissioned a second lieutenant. That's then right. what happened to him? Well, then, uh, I'll just take my notes mm -hmm. here. He, uh, he was assigned to the 445th Bomber Group, uh, 8th Air Force, and they're located in Timbenham Airfield in Norwich, England. Mm -hmm. And what happened then was that uh, the planes would fly solo mm -hmm. to their destination, to their assignment. And they were under secret orders, and these orders were not open until the plane was airborne. Uh -huh. So here he is in Carlsbad, New Mexico, which is down to the California border. Right. Fly this bomber across the country, across the United States, landing in Grenier Field in uh, New Hampshire. From there to uh, Nova Scotia mm -hmm. in Greenland, and then down to Norwich, England. 6,500 miles. And what kind of bomber was he in? It was a B-24 Liberator. Okay. So there were aircraft that took off from the country and never showed up. Because of an error in navigation, mm -hmm. they, they never appeared. They went into the ocean uh -huh. and they just never, never appeared. So I can't imagine what that flight must have been in a four-engine prop, 6,500 miles. Wow. So now he's in England. Tell us what happened next. Well, then they were assigned to the 701st Bomb Squadron, 
which was part of the 445th Bomb Group. Mm -hmm. And uh, movie actor Jim, Jimmy Stewart was a member of that same combat mm -hmm. wing as a staff officer. Um, one of the things that happened, the 8th Air Force suffered very heavy casualties in 1942 mm -hmm. in early 43 because of the daylight bombing raids they did over Europe, due in large part to the fact that we did not have a fighter plane that could stay with the bombers all the way into the target and back. Mm -hmm. The fuel range, it was a, a P-47 Thunderbolt. The plane, the fighters could not stay with them all the way. Mm. German fighters knew this and they would just stay far enough away mm -hmm. so when the fighters turned around to go back home they would then attack the bomber group mm -hmm. and so they suffered horrendous casualties and later on in that early part of 1944 just before my brother got there they introduced a, a new fighter plane which was the P-51 mm -hmm. Mustang and that had significantly longer range and it carried detachable fuel tanks, which could be dropped off. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the fighters could now stay with the bombers all the way into the target and back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now your, your brother is in England and he is on missions? Yes. Um, even with this new aircraft, the casualty rate was very high. Mm -hmm. It was figured at 8%. And the required mission requirement was 25 missions. So if you do the, if you do the multiplication at 8%, the chances are that you're not going to finish 25. Right. So uh, that, was, that was quite a thing. So where did your brother um, conduct the missions? Over, mostly over Germany? Over Germany, the mm -hmm. minute they, the minute they left, and crossed the English Channel, they were over enemy territory. Mm -hmm. So they were being hit by aircraft fire, in occupied France, mm -hmm. all the way in to Germany, and then back. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, with a B-24 bomber, you, you don't take evasive action. It's a very big, ponderous aircraft carrying thousands of gallons of gasoline and bombs, a couple of ton, tons of bombs, you fly in a straight line very slowly. Mm. And so German fighter planes with their tremendous speed could, could attack these bombers at will. And how many missions did your brother end up completing? He completed 30 because when they reached 25, uh, they were told, uh, guess what, we've increased the requirement to 30. And he lost many friends who had completed 25 and, and, and didn't finish 30. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the missions progressed, he was designated as lead bombardier, which meant that the other 11 planes in his group would wait until he dropped his bombs before mm -hmm. they dropped theirs. So that was tremendous pressure on him because if he made an error in his computations, mm -hmm. uh, everybody else uh, did as well. Mm -hmm. So that was an awful lot of pressure to, to have on him. And on more, more than one occasion, Og's bomber was met on the runway by a jeep carrying mm -hmm. Major Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm who would ask frantically, uh, did you get the bridge? How did it work out? So uh, that, was, that was interesting. Uh, as the weeks and months dragged on, there were fewer and fewer familiar faces who survived. Mm -hmm. They were replaced by new aircraft and new people. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things was that there was a standard 12-plane formation that the bombers flew that maximized the protection of all the aircraft from enemy mm -hmm. fighters. And the rule was that 
if someone got into difficulty because of enemy fire from an aircraft or fighter planes and they weren't able to keep up, the rule was that you had to let them go. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine what that must have been like mm -hmm. to be in that aircraft mm -hmm. and see your friends trail off and not be able to, to help them. Right. And I'm sure that uh, it was almost a total casualty situation because the German mm -hmm. fighters would look for stragglers and attack mm -hmm. them. So that, uh, that must have been very difficult to deal with. Um, finally, uh, my, my brother completed 30 missions mm -hmm. and was able to survive. And uh, in 1945, the war in Europe was over, mm -hmm. and uh, he came home at 21 years of age, mm -hmm. uh, the recipient of six medals. And you had sent along a letter about him describing one of the medals. If I'd like for you to uh, read that letter. Yes, this was... Uh, Published in the Framingham News, which is now the Middlesex News, uh, in December 1944. And what it says is that uh, my brother had received the Air Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster. Mm -hmm. And uh, the letter read like this. Today they pinned the Air Medal with an Oak Leaf Cluster on my chest, and as a ceremony was taking place, the last two years all went by in a flash. All the hours I had worried about getting my commission, all the nights I spent wondering what it would be like when I got overseas. I thought of everything, all you have done for me, how the three musketeers kept rooting for me, and that in two years I had never let them down with even one black mark on my record. And so I'm sending you the medal. It itself isn't very much, but it represents a hell of a lot. It represents seeing your fellow flyers go down in flames while you calmly try to do your job. It means a lot of heartbreak and most, and a lot of luck. The citation which I cannot send reads like this. For meritorious achievement in accomplishing with distinction several aerial operational missions over enemy-occupied continental Europe. The courage, coolness, and skill displayed by you in the face of determined opposition materially aided in the successful completion of these missions. Your actions reflect great credit on yourself and the armed forces of the United States. And the three musketeers were? Uh, my father, my sister, and, and me. Okay. So it was, um, so you got letters from your brother? Yes. My father got hundreds of letters, mm -hmm. which he very carefully kept. And I remember getting those letters, going to the mailbox, and seeing those crinkly light envelopes with those mm -hmm. airmail stamps on them, showing yeah. the bombers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you recall ever seeing those. They were airmail stamps. Mm -hmm. uh, and when my father passed away in, in, in cleaning out the attic, I found a large green uh, strong box mm -hmm. with all of the letters neatly arranged. Tell me you still all have All in envelopes. I, I gave them to my brother, uh -huh. because I figured if he ever wanted to uh, use them in a book mm -hmm. or whatever, that he should be the one that has them. So the letters still exist? The letters still exist. Oh, wow. Uh, my brother has passed away, but mm -hmm. my, um, my sister-in-law has them. Mm -hmm. But it's a chronology of what he saw, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, never, I never read any of them, but I'm sure that there was a lot there. But my brother, for some reason, never wanted to take on that task 
of mm -hmm. writing that particular kind of book. He wrote yeah. many others, but he mm -hmm. didn't, he didn't uh, want to uh, deal with that. That is incredible. So in the meantime, you're growing up in West Natick. That's right. Yeah, and is your father still farming, got remarried? Yes, we still, we did that for a while longer, and then mm -hmm. he, uh, you know, he gave it up. He, uh, you know, he uh, did it when he was young and mm -hmm. uh, younger, so. What else do you remember about the war years in that part of town? Well, I remember the air raid mm -hmm. uh, drills that we had, where we had to have special colored lights, like, and shades, you know, that covered mm -hmm. the windows right. so there was no light getting out. Mm -hmm. And the automobiles having cat's eyes, which meant that the bottom portion and the top portion of all the headlights were blacked out mm -hmm. and there was only a, a narrow strip mm -hmm. along the center of the headlights which gave you enough light to see where you were going. Okay. I also remember having special stickers on your car mm -hmm. that meant that depending on the letter on the sticker, yeah. which tell everyone how many gallons of gas you were allowed to have. Mm -hmm. And where are you going? You're going to school. Uh, where'd you go to school? Well, I went to the West School, which is now, uh, I guess, used as a- uh, It's housing. Housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to the Johnson School. Mm -hmm. I was the first class first sixth grade class out of there. Oh, wow. In fact, I went back and visited them and mm -hmm. saw the principal and she took me around like I was some kind of celebrity. <laughs> uh, and then I went to Coolidge Junior High School. Mm -hmm. Then I spent one year at the old Natick High School across the street, oh, sophomore wow. year. Uh -huh. And then junior year, we moved into the new Natick High School. Oh. And we were the second graduating class. Okay. Let's that. get back a little bit to your brother. Uh, was there, a, did he come home to Natick right after the war? No, by that time he was married and mm -hmm. he uh, was living in Tewksbury. He owned a house there. Mm -hmm. And so he, he did not come back to live here. Now tell us a little bit about uh, the process your brother took from being a war hero or at least a nice uh, was by the way what was his um, rank when he finished was he still a second lieutenant he was a first lieutenant he was a first lieutenant right so here he is first lieutenant flew 30 missions he gets back to this country and tell us what happened well he had faithfully sent home to my father mm -hmm. the majority of his pay mm -hmm. My father carefully kept it in the bank. And when my brother came home, he turned over that entire amount of money, which must have been a few thousand dollars. Mm. My brother went to New York, got an apartment, mm -hmm. newly married at that time, and started uh, writing. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't sell anything. Mm. He got rejection notices. He he, he did everything he could. He wrote all kinds of articles. Couldn't sell a thing. Went through all the money. Then uh, came back to New England and got a job uh, selling life insurance. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you used, you used to ride around and collect the premium every week. You'd knock on the door just like the milkman and the bread man used right. to do, and you'd get the $2 for the uh, life insurance. And uh, then later, uh, got a territory in northern Maine uh, covering that area. And was good at it and uh, was made the team leader of the team. And that was part of the Combined Life Insurance Company, which was a, a major uh, mm -hmm. company. And the owner of that company was W. Clement Stone, who was a high school dropout himself, who became a multimillionaire, and was part of President Nixon's uh, group of ambassadors. Wow. And so 
W. Clement Stone would get the reports of sales and he would see that this God forbidden place in northern Maine sales were much higher than anticipated and so he said who's doing this who's up there doing this from this territory that really shouldn't be bringing in the, the business and so he was told who he was and so he met with my brother Og and, mm -hmm. and said look I have this newspaper this house organ that we produced called Success Unlimited that mm -hmm. we mail to the policy holders. And it's really losing me money. Uh, would you be interested in coming here to Chicago and straightening it out? You know, change the format, mm -hmm. make it so that it so that it's more useful. Mm -hmm. So my brother by this point in time had remarried and so he moved to Chicago. And what happened was, and this is strange, if you read this, you would say, this is crazy. This could never have happened. This, this doesn't make sense. Uh -huh. uh, a writer was supposed to have an article in regarding Ben Hogan. And this, this small Reader's Digest size publication yeah. talked about people who have done wonderful things with their lives. And Ben Hogan had a serious car accident and was never supposed to walk again, let alone play golf, and mm -hmm. he, he did. So my brother had this hole to fill. It was deadline. So he wrote this article about Ben Hogan and put it in there. This gentleman named uh, Frederick Fell yeah was in a barber shop in New York City waiting to get his hair cut. And a copy of Success Unlimited was lying on the table. So he picks it up and he's going through it and he reads this story. And he gets a hold of my brother and said, I read your story. Would you be interested in uh, writing a book? I will publish it. So my brother said, yeah, okay. He writes the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World, and they print a couple of thousand copies, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. They print 5,000 copies, and they're gone. They're sold. Come to find out major companies like IBM and others were buying this book by the thousands and handing them out to their sales force mm -hmm. during their sales meetings. And that became a tremendous bestseller. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, what a strange story. <laughs> and, and that that spurred other mm -hmm. other books that he wrote. Well, part of the um, part of the origin story, as it were, according to the articles that you had given me, was that Og was having trouble with drinking. Yes. Uh, this is back what around in the 1950s. And he had thirty dollars in his pocket. Was going to go into a pawn shop, get a gun, and kill himself. Yes. But he went into a library instead, and started picking up on self-help books. Yes. Started reading Napoleon Hill mm -hmm. books. We lost track of him for a year. It was like he just dropped off the face of the earth. Uh -huh. We didn't know where he was. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that was that mm -hmm. downtime in his life. Right. And all that time, and, and he just never talked about his wartime experiences? No. It was just no, all I, in that little storm box. I, I tried to get him. I said, you know, I'm a writer. I, I, mm -hmm. You know, I don't put myself on his level, but I've always loved to write. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, I went to BU, Boston University, at night studying journalism. And one of the things we learned there was write what you know about. Mm -hmm. And I would say to him, why don't you write that book? You, you, it's not like me sitting here imagining what it must have been like. You lived it. Mm. So why don't you write that book? And he never gave me a straight answer as to why. 
I, I think he might have seen too much and he just couldn't deal with it. Because uh -huh. uh, he lost a lot of friends. Yeah, I know he passed away in 1996, but um, if the, if like an oral history project would have been around back then, do you believe he would have sat down and tell a story? I'm not sure. Mm. I'm not sure. I mean, he, he, he did a lot of speaking engagements around the world, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure whether he would have done that. Yeah, because you think that something in that wartime experience, the willing to serve, the willing to just uh, use his skills to go through no matter what, that thread must have appeared somewhere in his uh, self-help books. I think I think that that's true. I think uh, one of the things he, uh, if you read the ten scrolls that mm -hmm. he has, uh, one of the scrolls talks about, uh, I will persist until I succeed, mm -hmm. and that failure is just the germ of for success, and, and uh, you just push forward and you. Mm -hmm. You're a master of your own fate. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he always said was that uh, you are a truly unique individual. There has no one been quite like you since the beginning of time. Every single person is uniquely different. There are no two individuals that are alike. Mm -hmm. We're all different. We're all made up differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you are a unique individual, so take advantage of that ability. Uh -huh. Now let's get back to you now. Again, you're growing up in Natick right after the war. Very interesting time. The population is beginning to double. Yes. Almost triple and within the 15 years. So t uh, tell us what Natick was like. Well, all of a sudden, uh, Martin Sorrell and others began building hundreds of houses, ranch-style houses. Mm -hmm. We had a huge woods behind my house on Locust Street slash mm -hmm. D Street that uh, was converted overnight into mm -hmm. slab ranch houses and uh, by the hundreds mm -hmm. and uh, people moved into town and uh, it became quite different. Mm -hmm. Now, you were mentioning that in your sophomore year, you were at the high school over on Central Street, and then you moved into the new high school, the then new high school yes, on right. West Street. Tell us what that was like. Well, that was pretty fancy because coming from uh, the high school here, mm -hmm. which is where my brother went yeah. as well, mm -hmm. uh, it was campus style, it was had long wings and uh, we had a planetarium mm -hmm. and uh, it was all brick and very new and clean in an auditorium mm -hmm. because we used to do things at the Colonial Theater right. which was across the street for uh, events mm -hmm. and now we had this auditorium with seats like in the movie theater and it was it was quite a nice place to be. Mm -hmm. And what did you do in high school? Well, I uh, earned a letter in baseball. My mm -hmm. senior year, I, I played for uh, Eddie Casey, who was a wonderful mm. teacher and coach, his, mm -hmm. history coach. Later became principal of Coolidge Junior High, mm -hmm. a wonderful man. So I earned a varsity letter in baseball. And then I was the sports editor of the Sassaman, so I kind of followed along in my brother's footsteps. Mm -hmm. And I used to write a column in the newspaper that we put out periodically and put together the yearbook sports section uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for our yearbook. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what did you do after high school? Well, I, I, I got a job in a company in, in Wellesley, and then I, I went to night school studying journalism mm -hmm. and, and history, and then uh, enlisted in the National Guard in 1959, and 
went to Fort Dix, New Jersey for training. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that was like. Uh, well, it's quite a quite an awakening. Fort Dix was a nice post, though. Mm -hmm. It was open, not far from New York City, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was 75 miles away from New York City. So, if you were fortunate enough to get a weekend pass, mm -hmm. it was an hour's bus ride to to mm -hmm. go to New York and you know have fun. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I came home, I was five years as an enlisted man. And then one year before I would have finished my tour, I decided that I wanted to become an officer. So I, I applied for officer's candidate school and was accepted. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, the interesting thing was being in the old Commonwealth Army, which was that cavernous big brick building, which is now part of Boston University, since been mm -hmm. dismantled. And standing out there in our khaki uniforms, and I'm looking around, and I'm seeing people with a lot more rank and experience than me that, that, is, that they're deciding that they want to become officers. And I'm looking at staff sergeants. I'm looking at sergeant first classes. I'm looking at a warrant officer. I'm looking at a, a Marine Lance Corporal, and I'm going, mm -hmm. am I out of my league here or what? <laughs> I go and I don't have the background experience that these people have. And we began. And they made it very difficult for everybody. I mean, it was, it was hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were on you constantly. And what happened was that people began disappearing. They, they, they would quit. Uh -huh. the pressure was too much. So most of the staff sergeants and, and the Lance Corporal disappeared and the warrant officer disappeared. And uh, after about 15 months, uh, we graduated. And the funny thing is, and I've heard this in so many of the, of the movies about West Point and the other schools, was look to your left and look to your right. One of you you know, we're all lined up mm -hmm. in, a, in a line. One or more of you will not be here when graduation takes place. And it was the truth because only half of the incoming class graduated, and mm -hmm. I happened to be one of them. So little by little, they disappeared. And mm -hmm. what they were doing was trying to weed out those people who maybe could not handle the pressure in a wartime combat situation where you have the responsibility of, in the lives of these people in your hands based on your decisions that mm -hmm. you make. So mm -hmm. I was very proud to, uh, to graduate and, mm -hmm. and I never, this was 1964. Mm -hmm. We were all in our khaki uniforms and we got our gold bars mm -hmm. on and a full colonel comes in to the group who was sitting in the room. And he says, we're looking for volunteers for Vietnam. Eek. I'm saying to myself, well, I'll tell you what I was really saying to myself. Are you kidding me? And a very good buddy of mine, Kenneth Malumian, who uh, accident of the alphabet put us together, M-A-L-M-A-N. Mm -hmm. And what happened was when you were going through OCS, you learned very quickly that you help one another because they're all out to get you. All of the tactical officers mm -hmm. are all out. And so you help one another. So we were all bunk mates just about. And so if I fell behind in doing something, he would carry me. And if he fell behind, I would carry him. Mm -hmm. And Together, we help one another survive that whole thing. And it was amazing. You, we graduate, you know, he lived in Needham, I lived in Natick, so we were close. You know, we kind of, the last day we were there, we kind of hugged one another and said, let's keep in touch. But unfortunately, we didn't. Oh. You know, you got, I got involved, I got married and built a mm -hmm. house. 
he, he uh, stayed in the service, mm -hmm. so we lost track. And uh, one day I was looking at the Sunday Globe, and I don't know what made me do this, but I looked at the obituary page, and I saw his name. Oh, man. And I saw that he had gone to Vietnam, became a tunnel rat. And a tunnel rat of those guys, he was very thin and sign weak. They would go into the Viet Cong tunnels and blow them up. And he survived that. It was decorated by the South Vietnamese government. He came home and he had got some contract some kind of a blood disease, mm -hmm. probably from Asian Orange. I mean, they'll never admit that to this day. Mm -hmm. And he died at 43 years of age. Oh, man. And he's buried in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in a mm -hmm. military cemetery. So, uh, it's amazing mm -hmm. uh, what happens to you. You were telling me before the interview that you yourself had a couple of close calls. At least your unit did. You were part of the old uh, 26 Yankee. Yes, we were part of the 26 Yankee Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were two occasions where our unit almost got called up. One was in 1960 when the Berlin Wall was beginning to become assembled, and that's when they were, had the barbed wire up before they started building it with cinder blocks. And no one knew what was going to happen then. And we were away at Fort Drum in New York on summer maneuvers, and I was a private first class. And the rumor went around camp that we don't know what's going to happen. You may not be going home. You may be shipped right over to Germany. And so that, that was very frightening at the time. And then after I became a, a second lieutenant, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis took place. And uh, there were several days when no one knew whether those Soviet ships carrying ICBM missiles were going to turn around and go back mm -hmm. because the United States government warned them to turn around and they kept coming. Uh, so four National Guard divisions were chosen as, as being the primary divisions in this country. One from Wisconsin, one from California, one from Pennsylvania, and the 26th Yankee Division. And the word was that two of those four divisions were going to be activated for a period of one year. And no one knew which, which two they, 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 they were going to be activated. Um, and so you're waiting around for days trying to find out what my fate was going to be, whether we were going to ship out or not. And as luck would have had, had it, uh, the 26 was not one of the, of the two mm -hmm. chosen. So we, we uh, dodged that bullet. Mm. And, uh, so in your 10 years with the National Guard, were, was your unit ever called overseas? No, no. The, see, the, being in the 26th Yankee Division, mm -hmm. unlike the way it is now, to, to, uh, you had to take the whole division mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, you had to activate the whole, whole division. Now, because the 26th doesn't exist anymore, mm -hmm. you still see the YD patches yeah. and people mm -hmm. coming back. Now they're it's not a division, so they can individually take units, like mm -hmm. a medical unit or a maintenance unit, and they have done that, mm -hmm. and they've shipped them overseas for one or more tours, uh -huh. and you see them coming home now, you know, after a year. During that time when you were an officer with the Yankee Division, were you worried about being called overseas, especially to Vietnam? Uh, no, I, I, I guess not. I. They, they, they were not taking National Guard divisions over mm -hmm. to Vietnam at the time because they had the draft. Right. And so they were getting their requirements from uh, mm -hmm. the, the draft, pretty much. And so you, uh, when did you uh, leave the National Guard? 1969. And I, I was a company commander at the time. Mm -hmm. I was commander of the uh, 
a unit in Marlboro, Mass. There was an armory there on Lincoln Street, which no longer exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found that I, my, I had changed jobs and I was traveling a lot on my job, mm -hmm. which meant that I was out of town quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I wasn't able to do the National Guard justice by keeping up with my classes, because you had to do uh, courses of study right. to be promoted to higher mm -hmm. grades. And I just felt that it was not a good idea for me to try to skim by and, and do this thing in a mm -hmm. not, not a good fashion. So I resigned uh, mm -hmm. after 10 years. Okay. And you said you had a son, you have a son and a daughter. Yes, Matthew or, is my son, mm -hmm. a daughter is Sarah. And either, did either one of your children consider uh, military? Did they ever join? No. No, I guess that just wasn't their, their thing, I guess. They, uh, mm -hmm. they did not. How important was it for you to serve in the military? I think it was a, a great thing for me. I, I tended to be a little bit introverted and shy. And by going through OCS, mm -hmm. uh, they kind of knocked that out of me, literally and figuratively. <laughs> because if I were you know, a shy, quiet person, uh, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have survived. Yeah. And that gave me a tremendous amount of confidence knowing that these people that I started out with who had more time in grade, more experience than me, didn't finish and I did. So that mm -hmm. was an accomplishment just to be able to mm. stick it out and finish. And how about for AUG? How important do you believe uh, uh, serving in the military was important for him? Well, I think if you read Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, that really tells you an awful lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a different era, and people really felt it was their responsibility to, to go in. I've done a lot of research on Nedic High School football, and there was one class where two of the co-captains for the football team in their senior year quit school and join the service. Mm -hmm. uh, there were also many teachers in, in the Natick school system that, that went off to the service. Mm -hmm. There was a responsibility that people mm -hmm. felt they had, mm -hmm. and there was no question about it. And, uh, okay. and uh, what, was, uh, what was your career like? What did you do? Well, I uh, became an advertising manager for a couple of high-tech uh, companies and then went on to uh, selling advertising space for high-tech publications. Mm -hmm. uh, ended up as a vice president of sales for a uh, publisher's rep firm and uh, mm -hmm. it was a very good career. It was a little bit of traveling which was a little difficult on my wife Catherine and mm -hmm. my, my kids but it was uh, a, a good way to make a living. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say uh, to those who will be watching this in the future? No, I, I think uh, that people should uh, respect those people serving in the military, particularly those people now that are serving multiple tours of duty. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, guess that must be a tremendous sacrifice mm -hmm. for their families and children, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I certainly thank them for their service. Every time I'm in the supermarket or any other store and I see uh, a gentleman with a baseball cap on with uh, Vietnam or whatever, I make a point to go over and thank him for his service mm -hmm. because I realize the sacrifices that they have made mm -hmm. to, to serve our country. Well, Silvio Mandino, on behalf of your service and your brother, I'd like to thank you for coming and taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you for having me. It's okay. been a pleasure.